peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Uh, let me call, invite you to worship today in a quiet way that's appropriate today, this week. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says to Christians, grieve, but don't grieve as those without hope. And when he says that, he's actually saying there's two opposite mistakes you can make in the face of tragedy, death, and suffering. On the one hand, you can try to avoid grief. You can try to avoid weeping. You can try to put it out of your mind, get past it right away. And that'll either make you hard and inhuman or else it'll erupt later on and bite you and devastate you. But there's another mistake. It's to grieve without hope. The Bible indicates that the love and hope of God and the love and hope that comes from one another has to be rubbed into our grief. The way you have to rub salt into meat in warm climates or it'll go bad. Your grief is either going to make you bleaker and weaker, or it could make you far more wise and good and tender, depending on what you rub into it, what you put in. And that's what we're here to do. We are here not just to weep, but to rub into our weeping. Hope, love. And you see, in our call to worship, that's what the disciples of John the Baptist did in Matthew 14, 12. John the Baptist was cut down in the middle of his life by an unjust attack. And the disciples did two things. It says, And John's disciples, Matthew 14, 12, came, took up the body, and buried it. See, that's the grieving. And then they went and told Jesus. See, now all week we've been bearing up, some, unfortunately some of us literally bearing up bodies, all of us bearing up under an incredible load. Now it's time to go tell Jesus. It's time to take it to Jesus. It's time to lay it at the feet of Jesus. And if you go and tell Jesus about your troubles and your sorrows and all that's on your heart, he'll speak to you. And he'll say something like, that soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Let, let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, you are the consolation of the sorrowful. You are the support of the weary. Look down then, now, in tender love and pity on us whose joy has been turned into mourning, so that while we mourn and grieve, we may not have our hearts darkened, but rather might learn wisdom and grow strong in hope, that we might resign ourselves into your hands to be taught and comforted, remembering all your mercies and promises and love in Jesus Christ, who brings life out of death, and can turn all grief into deep and eternal joy. Oh, he's the one who taught us long ago to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Take a moment of silence and go and tell Jesus, even if you haven't spoken to him in a long time, even if you haven't spoken to him ever, tell Jesus what's on your heart in silent prayer. Let's pray again. Bow with me. Our Lord, this time we'd like to pray for your people and the church. First of all, Father, in our midst, in our midst perhaps here tonight, certainly in our midst today at Redeemer, 
in many of our churches, we have people whose hearts are broken. And Father, everybody else can stream in from all over the world and um, try to work on broken buildings and broken arms and broken legs and broken bodies, but only you can break. Only you can heal the broken souls, the fears, the grief, the rage, the despondency. Some of us have ex come very close to death. Some of us have people who are dear to us that have died. Some of us have felt like grieved people this week, even though we don't know anyone close who died, and yet we're shattered. Bind us up. Father, secondly, we pray for us as individuals. Make us what we need to be for our city. To a great degree, Father, we have been participating in the self-absorption of, of the great cities of our world. People come to the cities to take, to get, to build themselves up, to build up their resumes, to consume. But Father, we ask that you'd stop that. We ask that you would get us out of ourselves. We ask that you would humble us. You, we ask that you would purify us. We ask that you would um, wake us up and make us useful to our neighbors. Make us servants. Make us what we need to be in order to show the glory of Jesus and the love of Jesus to the people around us. Help us to be what the city needs us to be now, the kind of people the city needs us to be, the kind of neighbors and citizens we need to be. And lastly, we pray for the church as the church, as an institution, are the churches, not just Redeemer. The churches of the city make us wise enough to know how to work together and deploy and use uh, and bring to bear resources on the needs. Just make us smart about that. Make us generous about that. Teach us just how to, over the many years that perhaps in which we're going to be experiencing the shockwaves of this, uh, be Christian communities in a place that might be harder to be a Christian community than ever, economically and socially and physically. So, Father, we ask that you would protect us with your power, you would nurture us with, your, with a nearness, the sense of your presence. You fulfill us with your peace so that we can be like Jesus, who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life for many. So we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you one more scripture reading. This is the famous passage where Jesus is at the tomb of Lazarus in John chapter 11. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who's come into the world. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and those who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, they said, he... He's been dead for four days. And then Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And therefore, many who had come and saw what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And from that day on, 
they tried to kill him. This is God's word. Mary and Martha have the same problem we do. <laughs> they're, in the, they're, they're looking at a tragedy and they're saying, well, what is this about? Where were you, Lord, in all this? What's going on? How do we make sense of this? And Jesus moves through the ruins with four things. He wields four things. Truth, tears, anger, and finally grace. Truth, which he wields with Martha. Tears, which he wields with Mary. Anger, which he wields at the tomb. And grace, as we'll see, for everybody. Now let's go through those four, because you and I need those four but I'll go through them in a slightly different order just to show you how they cohere, how they hang together. First of all, look at the tears of Jesus and what do we learn from them. Now, the tears. Jesus, by the time he gets to Mary, she asks him a question, you know, a pretty big theological question. You know, what, Lord, why weren't you here? You could have stopped this. She asks him a question, and he can't even speak. He just weeps. All he can do is say, where have you laid him? He's weeping. He's troubled. He's deeply moved. Now, this has startled me about this passage for years. And let me show you why it's so startling. Jesus, when Jesus moves into a situation like this, he comes in with two things that you and I don't have. The first thing is he comes in knowing what it, why it happened. He knows the purpose of it. He knows what, how he's going to turn it into a, a glorious manifestation of the glory of God. He knows what he's going to do, Right? He knows that in just 10 minutes or so, they're all going to be rejoicing. So he knows why it happened, so he knows the purpose of it. You and I, when we go into these tragic situations, we have no idea. And the second thing he had, besides the truth about the situation, was he had power. He could do something about it. And we go into these situations, and we can't do a thing to undo it. Now, here's what's so interesting. We say, boy, if we had that, Put yourself in a situation. If you went into this knowing what you were about to do, knowing how you were going to turn everybody's uh, weeping into to joy in about 10 minutes, why would you weep? Why, why would he do that? I mean, why isn't he just, why isn't he just walking right by all the weeping and, and saying, <laughs> where do you see? And think about it. Does it make psychological sense to you that if you knew you were about to turn everything around in 10 minutes, if you, had the, if you knew what was going on and you had the power to do that, that you would be weeping, that you would be drawn down into the grief, that you would enter in to the, to the trauma and the pain of their hearts? Why would he do that? The answer is because he's perfect. Because he's perfect love. Because, is because that's, that's, that's perfect love. He will not close his heart, even for 10 minutes. He will not refuse to enter in. He doesn't say, well, there's not much use in entering into all this grief. After all, we're going to be putting it away in a minute. He goes in. Now, what do we learn from that? Well, I'll give you two things. One of them is kind of short, but I realize I really need to say it. It is nothing wrong with weeping and weeping and weeping at a time like this and kind of falling apart. Uh, there's a tendency, especially amongst Christians, who say, well, we know the truth. We know that everybody needs to turn to Jesus. You know, Jesus Christ was the most mature person who ever lived, and he's falling into grief. And therefore, here's what I want you to know. You, the best people will be the biggest weepers. It is not a sign of immaturity. It is not a sign of weakness. Not necessarily. Because really the better people, frankly, the people more like Jesus, if I can say it that way, are going to be the people who can't and don't avoid grief, who find themselves just pulled in to the grief of other people who are hurting. There's nothing wrong with it. Not only that, there's something very right about it. I will not say do not weep, for all tears are not an evil. And there we go. So that's the first thing we can learn from the tears of Jesus, that that there is absolutely nothing wrong. There's no, it's not, no lack of information. It's no lack of spiritual maturity. It's no lack of faith to just feel sucked into it all. But here's the other thing I want to suggest to you. We think we need to fix it. 
there's a whole lot of people who are coming to New York and will be here for a while, and we're glad for them to fix things. They're going to try to fix the, the buildings, and we need that. They're going to try to fix things, but eventually they're going to leave. And here's what I want you, here's what I want to call you to do. Jesus does not consider the ministry of truth, telling people how they should believe and turn to, turn to God. He doesn't believe even the ministry of fixing things is enough, does he? He also is a proponent of the ministry of tears. The ministry of truth and power without tears isn't Jesus. You've got to have tears. And what we have to do, I believe, among other things, do we have to do volunteer work? Yes, you'll, you know, there's all kinds of ways of doing that. Do we have to help the people who have been displaced? Do we have to help the people who are bereaved? Do we have to do... Yes. But consider this. I really hope I'm wrong. And I, I, mean, I, I mean, I'm not even... I shouldn't even say it that way because I'm not being that strong. I'm not, propo I'm not proposing this. But I hope it's not true that over the next months and years, New York will be a more dangerous place to live. I hope it's not true. I hope it's not true that this will be a very difficult place to live economically or politically or, you know, in other ways. I hope that this does not become, uh, it, it feels like it today, does it not? But the fact is I hope it does not become a more difficult, dangerous place, a more expensive place economically to live, a vocationally to live, a more difficult and expensive place to, to be emotionally and everything. I hope not. But if it does, let's stay. Let's enter in. Let's be, let's be part of the problems. <laughs> you, you know, it's not just fixing. It's not just telling people the truth. What the city's going to need are our neighbors and friends and people who are willing to live here and just be a great city. And, and what we need, for example, it may be more difficult and expensive just to be Redeemer for the next few months and years. I don't know. I hope not. But if it does, then that's what the best thing we can do for the city. Just be ourselves, though it's going to maybe cost more money, maybe take more time. Maybe we're going to have to be able to be a little less concerned about our own careers and more concerned about the community. So let's enter in, okay? Let's not just have to fix it. Let's enter in. Let's weep with those who weep. Let's not be afraid of that. That's the first thing we learn from the tears of Jesus. The second thing we learn about how to deal with suffering, we learn from the anger of Jesus. And somebody, if you were listening carefully, I mean, this is a pretty hard day. I want you to know it's pretty hard to talk, but it must be hard to listen to. I wouldn't know because I'm doing all the talking. It must be hard to listen. Did you notice anything in the text that I read to you that indicated Jesus was angry? No. And actually, that's another subject. I wish I had more time to talk about the oddness of the fact that, com that translators of every translation, ancient and modern, are afraid of what the text says. In verse 33, where it says, you heard me say, that when he saw Mary and everybody weeping, it says he was deeply troubled. That's what the translation says. But you know the Greek word there means to quake with rage? That's what it means. It means that everywhere else, you know, I saw one commentator who said it's lexically irresponsible <laughs> to not, I don't know why, the translators are afraid of it, I guess. It says that when he saw Mary and everybody weeping, he was filled with rage. And then in verse 38, it says, as he moved to the tomb, when he actually got up to the tomb, it says he was deeply moved. And that is a Greek word that means to roar or snort with anger like an animal, like a, like a lion, like a bull. And so the best translation would be bellowing with anger, he came to the tomb. I mean, that must at least mean nostrils flared with fury, and it might mean he was yelling in anger. Now, here's what we see. Why is this so relevant to us? It's relevant to us. Have you not noticed that at first shock, see, we're all going through this corporately, at first shock, then weeping and sorrow and grief, but then as the days have gone on, what's giving way to the shock and the grief? Fear and anger. Fear is another sermon. Fear is a little later. Just keep coming. But anger, rage, there's a lot of that around, isn't there now? But what does Jesus do with his? What does Jesus do with his rage? He's filled with rage. 
He's not just filled with tears, he's filled with rage. And so are we. But why? But wh wh what does he do with it? Oh, boy, that's important. There are two things he doesn't do with it. The one thing is he's actually not a Job's friend. Do you know what a Job's friend is? Uh, in the book of Job, a lot of bad things happen to Job. Unnaturally bad things, terrible things. You know, his children died, he lost all of his money, he became sick. And Job's friends walked in and they said, well, clearly you're not living right. God must be judging you for your sins. These bad things wouldn't happen unless God was judging you for your sins. That's what the Job's friends said. Does Jesus come in mad at Mary and Martha? Does, is he mad at the victims? Is he mad at them? Does he say, why in the world would this young man, this Lazarus, be cut off in the prime of life? This is unnatural. You must be being judged for your sins. He's not mad at them. The other thing that's interesting, when Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, that's one, of the, that's one of the most stupendous claims anyone's ever made. You know what he's saying? He doesn't just say, I can, I'm a healer. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the author of life. He's claiming to be God. But when he gets to the, temp, to the tomb, I'm sorry, he's not, he's, he's not mad at, at the victims. He's not mad at the weepers. He's not saying, buck up. He's not saying, what's the matter with you? Don't you know? But he's also not mad at himself. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? Here's God, and he's filled with rage. Here's the one who claims to be God, filled with rage, but not at himself. He doesn't demonize the victims. He doesn't demonize anyone out, including God. Now, you see, the reason I'm bringing this up is all of our leaders at, and all of our pundits and all, everybody who's speaking publicly about this, and sure are a lot now, they have to put it into a narrative structure to make sense of it. Do you notice that? You cannot make sense of things unless you find a storyline. You've got to find a storyline. And let me tell you two storylines that people are using that Jesus is rejecting here. The first storyline is, this has happened because America is being judged for its sins. Have you heard that one? Well, you know, now, interestingly enough, and uh, this, you know, I'm not saying this just because I tend to be a, a Charlie Brown moderate, wishy-washy, politically person. But the fact is the left and the right are doing it. People on the left are saying, well, America asked for it because of their social injustice. And people on the right are saying, look at our immorality. God is punishing us. Some of you have heard of the remarks on the 700 Club, unfortunately, this week. God is punishing us. Now, blame the victims. Let me just suggest something. to you. Can we think biblically about this? I'm not going to think emotionally. Let's think biblically. Can, how do you decide whether God is mad at you or, or country. How do you decide whether God's mad at you or whether he's pleased with you? How do you decide? Do you decide by looking to see how the life is going? No. For example, Jesus Christ, who was a pretty good person, don't you think? Had a lousy life. Rejection. See? Loneliness. I mean, everything went wrong. Romans chapter 1. Let's keep going. Romans chapter 1. There's a place there, and I, 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 hate to, I hate to bring this subject up without going into a whole sermon on it. St. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that the worst thing God can do to you is to give you a good life. There's a hint in there, and I, I know I'm bringing up a big site. There's a hint in there that the final punishment that God gives to hard-hearted, stubborn, proud people is to let them have a good life. It says he gives them up to their desires. He lets them have the prosperous life they want. Because it, why? Because that's the way to stay proud. That's the way to stay stupid. That's the way to stay, uh, you know, self-sufficient, that, uh, you know, I'm a self-made man or woman and I worship my creator. See, that's the way, in, in other words, the Bible says in Romans 1 that one of the worst things that can happen to you is have a prosperous life. Jesus Christ himself was one of the best people ever, had a very hard life. In Luke chapter 13, there's a place, ironically, boy, is it ironic, where in Luke 13, there's come up to Jesus and they ask him about two incidents. And one of them is there was a political massacre which a group of people were, were, were massacred by Pilate, and another one in which a tower fell on 13 people. And the question is, were they being judged? Were they worse sinners than others? Were they being, was, this, was that a judgment? And you know what Jesus says? No. And then he actually says, but why don't you repent? Almost like he's irritated with the question. So here, here listen, this might be too simple. I Maybe mean, I'm just being too simple. How do I decide whether God is mad at me or pleased with me? I read the Bible. The Bible says, love God, love my neighbor. 
Love your neighbor. If I'm not doing that, he's mad at me. If I am doing that, he's pleased with me. I can't, I can't decide, I just lost my job. He's mad at me. I was just in a car accident, and, I've, and I'm paralyzed. He must be mad at me. That's not how it works. The Bible says, Jesus suffered, not that we might not suffer, but that when we suffer, it makes us like him. And so it just, this storyline is not a good one. <laughs> Sorry, I got emotional. The idea that God is judging America for its sins, I don't think that storyline works. Jesus is not mad at the victims. On the other hand, there's another storyline. It's got more warrant to it, but it's, it's kind of dangerous. The other storyline is demonize. And the, other, the first storyline is God is judging America. Here's what the second storyline is. We represent goodness. They are absolute equal, evil. We are the good. They are the absolute evil. Now, you see, there's more warrant to this storyline, is there not? Because what happened was evil, and justice has to be done. But you can overreach, and that storyline overreaches Miroslav Volf put it this way, and he's a Croatian who ironically, by the way, was speaking at the United Nations prayer breakfast on Tuesday. But he's a Christian, and he's a Croatian, so he's been through this, and he says, enormous poison comes into my heart and into the culture of the world if I forget this. He says, enormous problems happen, quote, when I exclude my enemy from the community of humans and when I exclude myself from the community of sinners. When I forget that my enemy is not a subhuman monster, but a human being, when I forget that I am not the perfect good, but also a flawed person. And he says, oh, by remembering that, what does that mean? It means I get rid of, my hatred doesn't kill me and doesn't absorb me so I can actually go out and work for justice. So here's the problem with the second storyline. You see, Jesus doesn't say, I'm mad at God demonize God or demonize Middle Easterners or demonize anybody who's Muslim, you see. They're all the evil and shoot out their windows or their mosques. So he's not, what is he doing with his rage? He's not putting it out there against the people who have done this or God. He's not putting it in there. He's not saying it must be your fault. You know, you must be sinners. He's mad at death. He's mad at the tomb. He's mad at the death. And here's what the storyline that actually the best leaders are using. Jesus says, I'm going to turn this death into a resurrection. I'm going to bring out of this something even greater than was there before. That's the gospel, by the way, storyline. Out of the cross comes the resurrection. Out of the weakness comes real strength. Out of repentance and admitting your weak comes real, real power. Out of giving away and serving others comes real strength. Out of generosity and giving your money away comes real wealth. Out of the eater comes forth something to eat. See, that's the gospel storyline. And I'll tell you, the mayor and the governor and the, and the most effective leaders, they're not saying we're being judged, and they're not saying we're all completely good and they're completely evil. What they're saying is we can bring something even better out of this horrible thing. Out of this death, we can bring a resurrection. And think about this. New Yorkers, New York is filled with people who don't give a rip about New York, you know, all they wanted to do was to, was to get ahead. You know, why does a song, why, you know, Frank Sinatra, he said, you know, I want to be a part of it. Why? Because it's so much fun, because there's so much money around. Now do you want to be a part of it? Now do you want to be a part of it? And here's what could happen. What if New York became a community? Through this death, couldn't there be as a resurrection? Couldn't instead of a bunch of, you know, self-aggrandizing individuals and individualists, we actually became a community? What if, what if the United States really was humbled to realizing we are part of the rest of the world, we're not invulnerable, but at the same time actually became prouder in the best way, in the right way, of the democracy project that we are? See, that's what the best leaders are saying. Out of this loss of goodness, something even better. We could be a better, out of this death, we can turn this into a resurrection. We can be a better city. We can be better people. We can be wiser and deeper. We can be a better country. That's the right storyline. Because actually it incorporates what little truth there is in the others. Humbling yourself, see? Recognizing the need for change. Doing justice. So here's the point. Unless you learn how to handle your anger, unless you know what storyline to put it into so it circulates, 
can be rail and angry against America that brought this on itself, or rail and anger against God, how dare you let this awful thing happen, or rail against, you know, the demons out there who all look alike, so we're going to beat them up when we see them on the street. Or out of this death can come a resurrection. We're going to bring one out. And that's how the best leaders are working. And that's what you should do with your anger. Don't get rid of it. Be angry at death. Rage against the dying of the light. And say, I'm going to put this light on. I'm going to make it brighter. Now, somebody says, boy, that's a pretty hard thing to do. First of all, you're telling me that I've got to keep my heart open and enter in to the community here and into the, into the, and weep with those who weep. And then you're saying, be careful that I don't use my rage in a way that short circuits that whole process. And you say, I don't know if I can handle that. Well, but Jesus gives you something. And it's a third thing. It's the ministry of truth, not just his tears, not just his anger, but truth. When he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Hear me. The governor and the mayor, as I just said a minute ago, whether they know it or not, are using the gospel storyline. They have to. It's the best one there is. You can't, you can't miss it. You know, the moralistic storyline, we're the good people, you're the bad people. That doesn't really in the long run help much. You know, we're the good people. We've been telling you that you've been sinning and now you finally got what you deserve. And none of that works terribly well. The gospel storyline is the one that works. But the way it's working in our culture right now, it's all right. But what it is is somehow, this is, it's a general principle. Somehow, I'm sure if we work hard, somehow we can bring something better, a better city out of the ashes. And that's true, and that's right. But you know what? Jesus says, I can give you something so much more. But if you want to get more, if you want to get even a greater resource, if you want to get the ultimate way and power to handle this, and other than just a kind of hoping, a kind of altruistic, wishful thinking, you have to believe. See, he looks at Mar Martha, and he says, I can give you this power, but do you believe that I am the Son of God who has come into the world, that I am the one from heaven who's come down into this planet to die and rise again. Do you believe that? Now, the reason he asks, do you believe, that strikes you, does it not? He says, do you believe this? Because unless you believe that he is the Son of God who's come to the world, you don't have access to this incredible thing I'm about to tell you. Martha says, yes, I do. Do you? I don't know. I hope you do. At least you need to see that what I'm about to tell you is contingent on you having a personal encounter in faith with the Son of God. But here's what he offers not a consolation, a resurrection. What do you mean, he's, you're saying? What do you mean, not a consolation? Well, here's what I mean. He, Jesus does not say, if you, if you trust in me, someday I'll take you away from all this. You know, I wish I could get away from the sight of lower Manhattan. You know, that's, it's, it's unbelievable. We're going to have to live with that for years. You know, I mean, I, you know, and does Jesus come and say... I will take you away from all this. Someday, if you believe in me, I'll take you to some kind of wonderful paradise where your mortal soul will, will just be able to forget about all this. I don't want a place like that right now. I'm so upset and mad about what's, what we've lost. But Jesus Christ does not say, I give you consolation. He says, I'm giving you resurrection. What is resurrection? Resurrection means... I have come to not just take you out of the earth to heaven, but to bring the power of heaven down to earth to make a new heavens and new earth and make everything new. I'm going to restore everything that was lost and then a million times better. It'll be a million times better than you can imagine. Everything. The power of my future. The power of the new heavens and new earth. The power of the joy that will come and the wholeness that will come and the health that will come and the newness that will come and all the tears will be gone and all the suffering and all the death and all disease and all that will be wiped out. The power of that is going to incorporate and envelop everything. Everything's going to be made better. Everything's going to be made right. I, I have a nightmare, a recurring nightmare, that my wife finds a very... She, she's very flattered by this, this particular nightmare. It doesn't happen like every week or every month. I'm not, you know, in a pathological condition. It happens... It happens... Uh, you know, I don't know. It happens... How to think about it every year or so. And it might happen more, you know, you can't always remember. But let me tell you what that nightmare is. The nightmare is that my wife dies. 
Oh, in the nightmare, she's dead and she's died or something's happened. I'm trying to make it without her. That's my nightmare. Of course, she's very flattered by it because it's obviously my greatest fear. And uh, let me tell you something really weird. I almost like having the nightmare now. You know why? Because the first minute after you wake up is so unbelievably great. The first minute, maybe sometimes it's up to five minutes. Has this ever happened to you? The first minute, to wake up and to say, oh my gosh, it was only a bad dream. And everything bad that I was living through has come untrue. It's not just like I've awakened and somebody's going to give me something that'll kind of make it better in the sense of, you know, here's another wife. <laughs> no, what I like about waking up is that it becomes untrue. It was just a bad dream. This is morning. It's just a wonderful feeling to say, it's morning, and the it was only a bad dream. Do you know what Jesus Christ is saying when he says, I am the resurrection? He is saying not, I'll give you a nicer place, but he says, I am going to make everything that happened this week be a bad dream. I'm not just going to give you consolation. I'm going to make it come untrue. I'm going to incorporate even the worst things that have ever happened to you, I'm, it's, it's going to be incorporated. It's going to be, it's going to be taken up into the glory that is to come in such a way that only it makes the glory better and greater for having once been broken. There's nobody who puts it better than, the, than Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky says in the Brothers Karamazov this fascinating passage. Listen to it. He says, I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for that all the humiliating absurdity of human con contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage. Listen to this. That in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice. It will comfort all resentments. It will atone for all the crimes, for all the blood that's been shed, that it will make it not only possible, see, something so precious that it will make not only it possible to forgive, but to justify everything that happened. That, I feel like I'm looking into a deep abyss when he says that, and I know what he means. What he's trying to say is we're not just going to get some kind of consolation that will make it possible to forget. Everything bad is going to come untrue. Do you remember that? At the end of The Lord of the Rings, Sam the Hobbit, who thought everything was going wrong, he wakes up, and the sun is out, and he sees Gandalf, the great wizard. You'll all be seeing him soon in the movies. And, and he says, Gandalf, and I mean, th to me, this is the quintessence of Jesus' promise. He says, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. I thought I was dead. Is everything sad going to come untrue? The answer of Jesus is yes. Someday will be the great morning, the morning, not M-O-U-R-N, M-O-R-N-I-G. The great morning that won't just console us. See, that's what Dostoevsky is trying to say. But rather, we'll take all of those horrible memories, everything that bad has ever happened, and it'll actually be consumed. It'll be brought up back in. It'll become untrue. It'll only enrich the new world in which everything is put right. Everything. Do you believe this? <laughs> Jesus says, do you believe? You say, I want to believe this. Well, don't you see? If Jesus is the Son of God, who has come from heaven... If he's the incarnate Son of God, he's died on the cross so that we could be forgiven, so that God could, could destroy evil someday and all suffering without destroying us. See, that's the whole idea behind the cross. He pays the penalty for injustice. Do you believe the gospel? If you believe the gospel, then you've got to believe that. There's a lot of people in this room that do believe the gospel, but you haven't really activated that, have you, this week? That's what I'm here to help you do. You haven't thought about that. Your heart hasn't leapt. You haven't wept when you thought about it. Well, I hope tonight's the start. If, you, on the other hand, you don't really believe that Jesus is the Son of God, all I ask you to do is keep coming and explore it because Jesus says, unless you believe in me, that's just a pipe dream. If there's a God up there who's never become human, hmm, and you're down here just trying to hope that someday you'll be good enough, maybe he'll take you to heaven, none of this works. But if you do believe not in a God who, if we're good enough, we can get up to his heaven, but a God who is willing, this is the gospel, to come and die, to resurrect the whole world, a God who would come into our lives. 
If you believe in that, you can believe in that. C.S. Lewis at one point says, if we let him, he will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into dazzling, radiant, immortal creatures, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. He will make us into bright stainless mirrors which reflect back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. That is what we are in for, nothing less. Do you believe that? Do you believe this, Martha? Then you can face anything. Can't you face anything with that? I mean, and, and I know, I mean, I'm speaking metaphorically. Don't take me too literally. But everybody's wondering what kind of powers we're going to, what, is, what powers New York is going to put back. And I'm just knowing that God's going to put something back. See, in the new heavens and new earth, who knows? But you see, everything we have here, even the best things we have here, are just, are just a dim echo of what we're going to have there. Now, lastly, somebody says, how do I know this is going to happen? You know, I'd love to believe this, but how do I know? There's one more thing in this story you have to realize. He does. He tears, truth, anger, but at the very end, look. Did you notice the last line of the story, the last line of the text that I read? It said, when Jesus Christ... Rose, raised Lazarus from the dead. From that day on, the Pharisees knew they had to kill him. Now that he'd done that, now that he'd done that, his enemy said, now he's got to go. He's the most dangerous man there is. We've got to get rid of him now. Don't you think he knew that? When he was raising Lazarus from the dead, don't you think he knew that? Yes, he did, and here's what that means. Jesus Christ knew and made a deliberate choice. He knew that the only way to interrupt Lazarus' funeral was to cause his own. The only way to bring, G to bring Lazarus out of the grave was to bury himself. The only way he'd get Lazarus out of death was for, for him to be killed. He knew that. And boy, is that a picture of the gospel or what? Here's what the gospel is. We have a God who is so committed to ending suffering and death that he was willing to come into the world and in, be involved in that suffering and death himself. See, there's an awful lot of people just praying to a general God, but I'm sure that God somehow is loving us. Well, I don't know that. Only Christianity, Christianity alone of all the religions tells us that God lost a son in an unjust attack. Only Christianity tells us that. Only Christianity tells us that God has suffered. Because when somebody says to me, I don't know that God cares about our suffering. I don't know that God cares about it at all. And I say, yes, he does. I say, how do you know? Well, I tell you something. If I was in any other religion, I wouldn't know what to say. But what I can say is the proof is that he was willing to suffer himself. And I don't know why he hasn't been suffering and evil by now. But the fact that he was willing to be involved and he himself got involved is proof that if he, he must have some good reason because he cares. He's not remote. He's not away from us. Isn't it amazing that Jesus Christ with Martha and Mary was such so different. Martha and Mary, sisters, same situation, same circumstances, same brother, right? And they even had the same question. Did you notice that? Martha and Mary asked Jesus the same question word for word. But with Martha's case, Jesus almost gives her a rebuke and lays truth on her. And in Mary's case, Jesus just weeps with her. Why? Because he's the perfect counselor. Not like me. And I'm I want you to know that I try, and some of you have been counseled by me, but I want you to know I tend to be a truther. You know, I tend to say, well, that's my job. You know, I have all this information, and, you know, and I don't want to waste your time, and so I tend to want to fix things. I want to say, well, now you know, you need to know this and this and this and this, and then sometimes you just need somebody to weep with you, and I'm not the guy. And then sometimes, some of, sometimes you go to a counselor, and that counselor just only wants to weep, but sometimes you need somebody to, to kind of tell you the truth and, and bring you up short. See, we all tend to be, you know, none of, but Jesus is the perfect counselor. He will always give you what you need. If you need truth, if you need tears, he'll give it to you the day you need it. He'll give it to you in the dosage you need it. He'll give it to you in the order you need it because he's the only perfect counselor there is. So you need to go to him. You need to get his tears. You need to get his truth. You need to get his anger. You need to see all those things. But most of all, you need to get his grace. That's what you need to do. That's what we came to do. That's what we're going to keep doing. Let's pray.
Now, Father, we ask that you give us the possibility, give us the possibility of growth and healing as a congregation, as, a, as people, and as a city, because we have seen that your son is the resurrection and that your son died to prove that he's the resurrection. And with that hope, we can face the future. Now we ask simply that you'd apply this teaching to our hearts in the various ways that we need it applied so that we're able to be the neighbors and friends that the city needs us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For more of this series and other resources from Timothy Keller and Redeemer Presbyterian Church, please visit www.gospelinlife.com.